welcome to the Safety and Risk Success podcast with me, Christian Harris. And today I've got a co-host of sorts in Karen Hewitt, uh, because I'm sharing a recording of a recent safety roundtable that Karen and I both uh, co-hosted, uh, all about how to make people your biggest safety asset. Karen's an author on this topic uh, around people power, there's the title of her book, uh, and she's a real expert when it comes to transformational leadership and affecting change, uh, improving communication and culture in businesses all around the world of safety. So the first half of this is me and Karen having a chat, effectively uh, an interview, uh, before we then open it up to conversation with the people that were uh, joining us on the roundtable, some familiar uh, names and faces that you'll have um, heard before, um, if you've listened to any of the roundtable sessions. Uh, and we have a great chat all around uh, this topic of um, harnessing people to turn them into a safety asset. Hope you enjoy it. Uh, see you on the other side with conversation and then a roundtable with Karen Hewitt. Cheers. Welcome to the Safety and Risk Success podcast with Christian Harris. We believe that proactive safety and risk management powers business performance. Each week, we explore this theme, sharing guests, stories, insights, trends, hints, and tips. You can find us on all the major podcasting platforms, and video versions are available on YouTube. But for now, let's join the conversation with Christian. Thank you for joining today's session. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by Karen as co-host. So this is the first time we've tried a co-host on the roundtable. So interested to get your feedback um, afterwards and, and see uh, if you like this format. Um, I've got a couple of other um, co-host uh, events lined up um, over the next couple of months as well. So hopefully it, it, it all goes well and smoothly, which I'm sure it will. Um, I think most of you here know me, but my name is Christian Harris. I run a business called Slip Safety Services. So in my day job, I help clients to stop slips, falls, uh, accidents, um, but um, spend most of my life, it seems like all of my life, uh, doing events and content and uh, raising the profile of being proactive around safety, which is what all this safety roundtable is all about. So Karen and I are going to have a chat <clears throat> um, about this, this topic, uh, and then um, we're going to open it up, as we always do, at the end for interactive um, discussion. So do uh, get involved in the chat. Uh, do put any questions in the chat that you'd like me to cover. And I'll ask Karen any questions at the end if you're not wanting to unmute. Um, and yeah, we'll uh, we'll get started. So Karen, uh, thank you for joining firstly. Um, I thought we'd start with um, asking you something not directly about safety or about the topic today. Um, what did you learn when you were working as an interpreter at the UN? What a great question. Thanks for having me on, Christian. I'm very excited to be a co-host. Um, I'm just feeling the power already of co-hosting. Um, yeah, when I worked at the UN, so I trained, uh, I had a, a bit of a midlife crisis, as some of us do, and I trained to be a simultaneous interpreter at the age of 40. And it was just an amazing experience. It was a career that I didn't stick with, which was quite a big decision for me because it was really hard to train as an interpreter because you're essentially training for a year to look at, um, to learn how to process information in a different language. So you've got information coming in, in one ear, in your headphones, in one language, and it's coming out beautifully in another language. So I didn't stick at it because it was quite a stressful career, but I guess I learned to communicate differently because when you're an interpreter, I remember what my teacher said to me was communicate. You need to communicate, imagining you've got the person in mind that's listening to you and be absolutely determined that they're going to understand you. So I think what we tend to do, because it's easier, is we communicate to say what we want to say in the way we want to say it, you know, in all the interesting styles we have and forgetting that it's only really as useful as it is to the person listening to it. So, you know, if we're using anecdotes that only people in one country or language would understand, then it's not so much use to people. So it's more about how you 
package that up when you're communicating. So that was probably one of the most amazing things, transferable skills that I learned to take with me into what I do today. Yeah, it's impressive. And and having done French for my degree and done a little bit of, not at that level, but a little bit of um, translating and, and interpreting. I remember I did in my gap year, I went to France and um, did some interpretation at a education conference. And it's very, very stressful and difficult. And yeah, it's all about getting their, that, that sort of context across, isn't it? Um, in, in such a way that things like idioms um, and jargon, you know, so something I think that we're guilty of in the safety world is using jargon and, um, mm. you know, and, and, and um, words that perhaps uh, we understand, but doesn't necessarily mean our audience will understand them. And then the, the message gets lost. So it's really important to avoid that. Yeah, we'll put a ban on idioms and acronyms already. Well, I like acronyms, though, as long as you explain what they mean. Um, I, I live yeah. my life. I live my <laughs> life trying to create acronyms to make um make uh make things kind of easy to remember that's that's one benefit of an acronym i suppose is you can make something a complex um, yeah something complex easy to remember um so uh following on from then do you want to just give us a quick um idea of you know how you ended up uh wh where you are and, and perhaps just a couple of the the key highlights of kind of what you do now yeah, so while I was in my part-time interp interpreting career, I got offered an amazing opportunity to go into a large international company where they just wanted somebody, funnily enough, who spoke a few languages, was prepared to travel, could stand on two feet and deliver training. So I did that and it turned out to be health and safety leadership training. So my learning curve, as you can imagine, was exponential. And a lot, still today, a lot of what I know about health and safety, I've learned on the go like that, just really listening to people on the ground. Because actually, when you don't know a lot, you're forced to ask questions and you're forced to listen. And when you listen, it's actually the people, you know, the people you've got in your training sessions that really know their stuff. And they give you so much if you ask the right questions and you listen. So I ended up 10 years in, well, actually, yeah, 10 years in two two large organizations in the corporate health and safety department, upskilling myself in things like coaching, transformational leadership, health and safety as well, the technical skills, and really specializing as that, I guess, leadership, behavioral communication, engagement person within the corporate health and safety team, which is quite a luxury really, as a corporate health and safety team to have that niche go-to person that you can rely on that can do that really important part of health and safety. And then I decided to go out on my own. So now I do that for myself and I specialize just in that niche because I think it's a really important niche and one where I can add value with the skills that I've got. Yeah, definitely. And it's, it's funny, isn't it? How you often find people fall into this world. You know, um, I certainly didn't uh, grow up with a burning desire to uh, be be looking at why people slip and trip and things like that but actually when you um get to know about this subject it is really fascinating and it affects all aspects of our lives and it's a really valuable and an interesting um area to to work in isn't it so uh, so that's great and tell us a little bit about the book uh, karen as well the book yeah i wrote a book called people power i think that's when you say the book i think that's the one you you mean and um yes uh, sneakily behind me um yeah people power i wrote and published in published it in august 2021 so i had to think then because i was tracing it back because i just had my daughter so <laughs> she was three months old we were stuck in the covid lockdown at least we were in the uk and uh i thought i I've got a bit of time on my hands turns out I didn't have that much time on my hands but you know foolishly I had no idea what motherhood was going to entail I thought I've got time to write a book here and I actually thought if I don't write it now then it's not going to really have the same impact because I need to write it when Covid's on because I saw Covid as this massive opportunity to bring back the focus onto health and safety because I think health and safety gets a bad rap it's uh, undervalued because we tend to just focus on when things go wrong and people just trust that it's never going to happen to them. But actually, 
we all really, really need health and safety. So I thought, let's use this opportunity. So I wrote a book called People Power, which provides the process to cross company engagement. So if you want to get everyone in an organization really fired up about health and safety, doing the same things, saying the same things, if you want to get a really clear, aligned strategy, then I've got a three step process in the book. So I, I took all my learnings really from what I did in the large organizations, what I'd learned along the way. And I put it into a blueprint in the book because I wanted to share it with other people so that we could save more lives. Good stuff. And some of those themes that you touched on there are, are things that anybody following me on LinkedIn will be, will be uh, familiar with me uh, banging on about quite often. So uh, good to see that we're aligned on, on that. So um, we're, we're going to talk, uh, Karen, today about how to turn people into your biggest safety assets. Um, there's two key words in, in that phrase that I think are probably worth a bit of definition, which are people and assets. So how, how are we going to define those in, in, that, in the context of today's discussion? Yeah, I think it's really important to define them because probably a lot of people are on this call because the idea of turning pe um, people into your biggest safety asset is quite aspirational. It's like, wow, if only we could do that. But really to understand what we're talking about, you've got to break it down. So if you Google asset, I'm not sure what the exact definition is, but it's something to, oh, <laughs> good question coming in already. It's something to do with releasing future values. So it's an accountancy term. I'm not an expert accountant. I did study a little bit. And I know on a balance sheet, you've got your sort of tangible and intangible assets. So you've got the intangible ones, which are goodwill. But you know that in the future, it's going to create you some future value. We, we think of economic value. And I guess so if a person in an organization is an asset, they're creating some value for health and safety. So they're not just, you know, I guess maybe them following the rules is creating some value, but I won't go into that. I'll just stop at the definition. Um, I'm just looking at your face and your eyes there, Christian, to think, am I going into too much detail? So let's go back. No, to don't worry. I'm, 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 my, I'm, I'm looking very shifty with my eyes because I'm scanning the chat and I'm scanning this and I'm scanning that. So don't worry. Don't worry about me. I'm not having a seizure or anything. Yeah, I just realised when you're on your specialist subject, you can go on for too long. So I need to keep myself in check. So <laughs> let's go back to, to the people. Who are we talking about? Because that's quite a bold statement. How do we make people into our biggest safety asset? I think instantly we tend to get drawn into tunnel vision and thinking, well, the people we want on board are the people on the front line, last line of defence, facing the biggest risks, probably most qualified to do something about it. And in a way, we are targeting those people, because if you're reading through accident investigations and reports all the time, you'll see that there was probably almost always somebody who could have been that last line of defence and wasn't. But there's also a whole network of influence throughout the organisation. We've got the top down line management influence because people are influenced by what they perceive to be their line manager's priority. So if you cascade down that influence, that's going to have an impact. But also yep. some organisations are matrix. So you've got other, I guess, more informal influences, people that are influencing without line management responsibility. So we're looking at that whole network of people within an organisation, people that are already engaged, people that are not engaged, people that think, what's that got to do with me? I work in an office. I've never been to a site. That's got nothing to do with me. So different populate, so I guess a map of influence, a network of influence and the different populations with their different needs. Yeah. And would you, would you include sort of external stakeholders within that? So, you know, let's say, for example, uh -huh. I know you used to work in, a, in facilities management. So, you know, we're operating a big business um, and we've got a partnership with a facilities management company and a lot of their staff are on site and they're delivering key services for us. You know, would you include those kinds of people? So this is exactly why we have a round table, Christian, because no one person can have all the answers by themselves. And I did miss out the external stakeholders. And you're right, because sometimes the lines are a bit blurred. You've got people working on client sites where the client has more perceived authority. And if they're not on the same page, it's really difficult. 
even if we align all of our people to get them to speak out, um, if there's a client asking them to do something quickly, and I've got so many examples of that, so absolutely external stakeholders. So anyone that's involved, if it's if you've got people working on um, multiple audiences working on the same site, and there's visitors coming to the site as well, and there's clients there, then all of these people that are involved. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So when when you explain that as a concept, um, I'm sure uh, everybody on on this call and everybody that. Um, watches or listens to this um, recording in the future will uh, be saying to themselves, that makes perfect sense. So why haven't we got to that point already? You know, what are the what are the challenges? What are the blockers? What are the trends or the drivers that are stopping uh, organizations from getting that maximum value from um, from that network of people as an asset already? Yeah, thanks, Christian. I'd be delighted to think that that already makes perfect sense, which means I am making some sense today. Um, and I think it's quite logical. I don't think it's I'm not really saying we have to deploy anything new here. But in a way, we're going back to basics because you're just really taking a strategic a strategic an approach to your people management for safety as you do for everything else you manage, because everything else we manage is really rigorous. And I think probably what gets in the way with large organisations, and unfortunately it's getting worse, so we do need to do something about it, is people are uh, people in organisations are under pressure. So often the tone is being set from the top. The people at the top, they're under pressure from markets, shareholders, they're under pressure from regulations. So there's more and more regulatory pressure more market pressure you know it we can see in the news that companies are having more and more pressure put on them and now we've got things like esg as well so as consumers we're demanding more as well so this cycle of pressure happening which means that companies have taken on a lot they're doing a lot of different things so maybe there's not the time to really address any one thing in depth and there's not enough time to communicate. So the, so the communication tends to be top down, communicating to transmit rather than to make sure people understand. So it just goes one way. We've also got with the change in technology, you've got all the different communication channels. So if you think about it right now, we're sat on this call. If you haven't put your devices on airplane mode, you probably get things coming in from other channels. So it's coming in all the time you're trying to manage that. So as a human being, we're trying to digest information that's coming at us from all angles. It's coming at us top down without people putting an effort into whether we'd understand it or not. So it's really, uh, it's quite difficult to be engaged, I would say, within an organization. Not because we don't want to, but because of these pressures. And also we're guilty of doing the same things. You know, we're guilty of sending quick emails rather than sitting down and having a quality conversation with someone to make sure they understand. So the only way around that really is to create more time for proper communication by maybe doing a bit less, you know, being a bit more focused. What are the things as an organisation we really want to do? Let's get rid of some things off our plate so we can do some subjects in more depth and communicate more clearly and more simply. Yeah, again, uh, something that well, we we spoke about recently, you and I as well, but but definitely resonates with me because I my my sort of fear and and my experience is that when it comes to the the expectations and the workloads being placed on uh, safety professionals, there's just more and more and more being added to the plate, and their their um, roles and responsibilities are getting wider and wider and wider and wider and stretched. And if you stretch something out wider and wider. Uh, you lose the the depth um and so i can see you know that that is a big big challenge just in in the safety world never mind all these other um aspects of, of business um yeah. yeah yeah and i think there are ways around that so it's not all gloom and doom because if companies decide they still want to keep doing the same old thing like hamsters on the wheel um and keep trying to do everything really well moving really fast not taking time you know to move, I guess, from firefighting to proactive 
communication, then even as a health and safety leader, to engage more people, you can start focusing on key principles, because if things are fragmenting, like you describe it, Christian, I imagine um, all these sort of things are floats in a swimming pool sort of moving apart and you're trying to grab hold of them. So things are fragmenting. You have to look at what's what are the common principles here? So that's what I work on, on the basis of common principles across safety, health, well-being, ESG, common principles, common behaviours, really simple message that everyone can see their role in it. Because that's another thing that people complain about in organisations. They can't see their role in the big picture. So if you've got a big picture for health and safety, this is what we're going after. This is how we're going to do it. This is what capabilities we need. This is what good's going to look like. And you can communicate that really simply. And again, I've got a really simple triangle I use for that. Then that will make it easier. Yeah, that, um, that, that makes sense. Um, I'm going to talk over your coughing. <laughs> I'm doing the same in the background. As well. It's terrible. This, uh, this, this um, post-COVID world where all these bugs are really really hitting us uh, hitting us hard um so m moving on then to kind of elaborate on some of this stuff that we've started talking about we've kind of set the scene a bit in terms of you know why this is important and then what some of the challenges are um in terms of you know trying to to move beyond that and and perhaps um as you were talking about swimming pool i was thinking of uh, of an analogy of some dough or some um you know thinking like a if you've got a uh, a pizza, if you roll it up into a ball, then it's thick and probably quite um, uh, malleable. But if you start rolling it out too thinly, then all of a sudden it can break uh, quite easily. So there's another another analogy for us to to use. Um, so what uh, what are some of the things then that we can be doing? Um, perhaps looking at that triangle or, or anything else you want to go through in terms of principles, frameworks to to start to improve in these areas. So there's one thing that I have done before. Sorry, my voice is breaking a bit, but I'm going to stay with it. Is I've gone through all the incidents or the serious incidents in an organisation. And I've not looked at root causes. I've looked at common behaviours. So what are the common behaviours that weren't in place yeah. and would need to be in place that would make a difference? Yeah, that's so a start. Yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a sensible um, thing to do, I think, because um, it, you know, I was with somebody yesterday who uh, is a, is a fan of the podcast. doesn't doesn't uh, attend the roundtables, but he but he often listens to the podcast. And he was telling me about some of the recent episodes he's been listening to. And you know, he 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 leads safety and risk in a retail um, environment. And he said, you know, when I start to look at why things happen, why incidents happen. Um, it's the behavioural piece and wh where, you know, things perhaps are not getting done that, that should be getting done. Yeah, and it's and you'll find, you know, you can come up with a set of positive behaviours then and then you can find things like, um, let's say, for example, in an incident, there was an opportunity for somebody to ask, quest ask a question and they didn't. They didn't feel able to ask a question. And obviously that's connected to psychological safety. People feeling comfortable enough to ask a question. So if you can resurrect that as a behavior, that it's okay for anyone to ask a question and you can sort of train them in the type of questions that are good to ask, questions that are gonna engage and inspire people. You know, even a simple question like, what do you think? In fact, that is probably the best open question you can ever ask. And next time I'm coughing, I would just stop and say, what do you think? What do you and think, then, Christian? And I'll, and I'll, get, I'll, I'll, get, I'll start yeah. coughing. Um, I like that. I also like um, asking what, you know, why is that or why? And, and asking that three or four times um, to, get to, to get down to the real nitty gritty. Because most of the time, if you ask somebody a question and, and you, you know, say, why is that? Um, they tend to give a, in my experience, a relatively superficial answer. And why and why if you keep asking why you kind of get them to go deeper and deeper and deeper um and that's a good way of of uh of questioning people to to get to the the the, the key um elements that we want um 
Um, Karen, I've got some good news. You've sold a copy of your book. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hooray. <laughs> That's a silly dance. <laughs> That's good. Um, what, what, what else uh, did you want to uh, cover off, Karen, before we sort of open this up to, to getting some, some other people's views and, and questions? And are there any, any key points that, that you wanted to, to touch on that we haven't covered yet? Yeah, I think one thing, I just wanted to say something about, I guess, how you might do this, how you get everybody aligned. Yeah, perfect. Um, but I am really keen to hear what everyone else has to say about it, because I know everybody, if you're on this call, you can have your own views on it as well. And this is just my views based on my experience. But so transformational leadership. There's a style of leadership that creates change. And it works really well because it starts at the top and cascades down, which is where most organizations, it's how most organizations operate. Yeah, that's definitely true because, you know, the lead is, is always going to be taken from, from the board and the management team, isn't it? And all you need really to start that off is a big vision. So if you think about it, JFK, I want to put a man on the moon. Really exciting, big vision. Now, we're probably not going to put a man on the moon, but we might have a vision of being the safest company in our industry, which is something that a lot of people would want to get behind. And that's the good thing about safety. Um, I mean, if you, I'm sure you've read the um, case study of Alcoa, uh, which was, I think there was a good summary of it in the book called The Power of Habit. Um, where, the, um, yeah, the, the, the CEO came in and basically said, Paul O'Neill, and basically said, you know, I want us to be the safest company in America. Um, and he used that as a way of galvanizing everybody because safety is a message that we can all buy into and get behind because we, we know that, um, you know, it's important for people not to, not to get hurt and so on. And, and, and that really worked, worked very well. So I can see that working. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so once you've got that vision, it's just a case of, how do you get everyone bought into that? And you do that with that segmented approach. You get people in different populations in different groups, present the vision, ask them what they think, how they see themselves involved in that. So really it's a bit of a coaching style. So transformational leadership is often called coaching in action. So you set the big vision and then you coach others to get involved according to their strengths and challenging their thinking. So they feel good because they're using their strengths and they feel good and motivated and they feel like they're growing as a person because you're giving them new skills and you're challenging their thinking. Yeah. And and in terms of like um, th that vision piece then, for, for those of us on the call um, today, it might be worth... Um, asking what people's thoughts are about how what sort of vision they would put forward but i'd be interested to um to, to to raise this one question which is there's a lot of discussion around you know target zero for example is that something that would be a good vision because it's very aspirational or could that sort of that sort of vision backfire a little bit because people might think it's maybe unachievable yes Really good question. So I'm just going to give my brief view on that because I'm sure everyone else has a view. So I think it's a really good vision. I think the challenge might be in the way it's formulated because it's when you're saying zero harm or zero incidents, you're motivating people towards what they don't want, which means as soon as you have a period of time, without incidents, people lose motivation. It's a bit like if you're on a diet and you say, I want to, I don't want to, I want to lose weight or I don't want to be an unhealthy weight. So you'll go to the gym for a while. And as soon as you lose a bit, you become more relaxed about it and your motivation goes down again. You see it in the safety wave in organizations, people are most motivated when you've just had an incident and you haven't had one for a while and the motivation goes. So what we really want, and I don't know if my arms go in the right way across the screen here, but we want to, is looks that going good, yeah. into your yeah. future? Yeah, looks good. Okay. Yeah. So my arms going into your future, you want a really steady line of motivation for everyone 
for the next 10 years, let's say. So if you change that zero harm vision into we want to be the safest company in our industry, that will keep everyone motivated for 10 years or so. But if you say zero harm, you might have, we're, we're talking about the same thing because that line eventually takes you to zero harm. But the way we've worded it, it keeps people engaged because it's something positive that's not quite attainable. And even though the zero harm isn't also isn't attainable, you might have the motivation dips when you've got a period of zero harm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And it's it's interesting to it's, it's a topic that we've discussed before uh, on, on these sessions as well, a little bit a, around the sort of negativity uh, of safety, as in, if you look at SHP and their most read articles, it's all about prosecutions and uh, uh, and court cases and things like that, rather than that sort of positive spin of, yeah, we've be we've become the safest in our industry or, or whatever it might be. So there's this kind of challenge around getting people's attention. Uh, and as you said, keeping it, because um, it's quite easy to get the attention with the negative stuff and something bad happens and look at this fine or whatever, but that doesn't necessarily sustain the attention going forward. And I think a challenge that I would throw out to, to everybody is you know what can we do to be a bit more positive um about this rather than sort of harping on the some of the negative stuff i just found myself a lovely locket suite so i'm just having a little munch here it's doing wonders for my cough but, oh, um, very good <laughs> yeah so it's not um I mean, that's why I do a lot of helping people to formulate a vision, but it's understanding what impact it has on motivation. Hmm. You know, it's, um, and once we understand that, we will look, let's, how can we have the same vision, but word it differently? So in both of my books, actually, I've got, you know, in the People Power book, there is a formula for how to word your vision. And the more ambitious you can be, the better. Because if you think about, let's use the example of football. Uh, or any kind of sports, but I'm going to go for football, hoping we've got enough people interested in football on the call. Um, let's say, oh, you know, because England, for example, have this constant aspiration to win the World Cup. Um, I think the last time we did was 1966, um, was it? Correct, yeah. But everyone still gets behind it because it's that exciting. And when you look at the football team, in fact, I seem to remember before this year's World Cup, um, our lovely manager wrote a letter to England. It got published online and it didn't just talk about what they were going to do for the game, but what they would do for whole, the whole community because people remember where they were at that time when, the, you know, when the, the team is playing. So it goes far beyond one individual person, one team, one match. And, you know, it's the same if you look at why a Brazil so successful because they managed to get the whole country around football. They've got a real culture that every single person is involved. So they managed to create this vision around football, which goes beyond any single star player and gets everyone else involved. Yeah, I like that. I mean, I, I talk about, I'm interested to get your view on this. So I, I talk about having a vision of um, half a million fewer slip and fall accidents around the world. And for me, that's a goal that I can't achieve on my own. And I, th I see that that's why I see that as a bit of a vision because it's something that I can't ever possibly hope to achieve on, on my own. We couldn't even achieve that just in the UK because there, you know, um, it, it would be very difficult to, um, uh, to, 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 to prove and track, but, but if you could galvanize people around the world to take, the issue of slips more seriously then we potentially could achieve that kind of improvement so is that would, would you say that was you know how would you score that out of 10 as a vision is that is that a good one or do i need to go back to the drawing board and read your book i think i would flip it into some positive language because you were talking about a percentage less and what about a changing it into a percentage more of people not getting injured of or people being safe and well 
it's a bit difficult because yep. you're working in a specialist area. I yeah. appreciate that. But everyone feels better about something that's positive. And mm. also we're more motivated moving towards something positive rather than away from something, from something we're avoiding. Yeah. Um, and when I say that, actually, we'll be when we're moving away from something we're avoiding, you think about deadlines. Um, there's, there's a short burst of positive energy. Like if we've got a short deadline or if we're under pressure, but it doesn't last. So I'm talking about this sort of more lasting motivation. So I would change it into the into the positive and make it more unachievable, more generic, because you've made it quite specific with the, yeah. the number. Mm -hmm. Because the more generic you make something, the more people can get behind it yeah. and make their own interpretations of it. You think about the title of this webinar, How to Make People Your Biggest Safety Asset. So you're thinking, well, what people, what asset? But you can draw your own interpretation. So it draws people in and they create their own story. Mm. And then you can get people aligned around a more generic message and everyone brings their own story and contribution to it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Adam's just said, uh, remember that a vision is different to a target. Yeah, I think that's quite right. And I suppose, again, what, and perhaps I do need to go back to drawing board, but um you know, I can't target um, half a million uh, full reductions because that's just far beyond what I can achieve myself. So therefore, that I was thinking of it as being something bigger that I need to um, galvanise people to to work with me on and, and we can all strive towards. But uh, anyway, there we go. Um, I'll, I'll go back to the drawing board on that one and, and we'll uh, we'll see if we can improve it in the, in the future. Actually, maybe not the drawing board. Maybe you could have a vision and a target because I yeah. think that's a really good target. That could mm. be your three-year target or something yeah and you have a vision that's more bigger picture so yeah. you've got your target there and then what's something more generic that would take you into 10 years into the future yeah or there more. We go. perfect perfect so i've i've cleverly pe people may have thought that i was doing that uh to try and get some free consulting from you uh, in a selfish way but that wasn't the, that wasn't the case at all because i'm such a pro at hosting interviews like this i actually crafted that uh, as a segue into the plugs because i want to give you the opportunity karen to talk about what you can do and how you can help people and there's you, you, i've given you the opportunity to give a little snippet of insight to me to to show the value that you can bring so give, give us some, us all in there give us some plugs of of um some of the stuff that that you're doing and people can get involved in uh, and then we'll start to open it up some questions okay so i'm yeah i'm Working with people at two levels, which I find is most useful because I can't be everywhere. Sometimes people will get me into the senior leadership team, just as sort of a, a one off hit, I would call it to, I guess, get them thinking differently, because sometimes as health and safety professionals, we're pulled in all different directions and we struggle to influence. And sometimes it's easier as an outsider to come in and influence and just um, get people I guess really thinking about what they need to be talking about and why, because if we're not making a big fuss at the top of the organisation, we can't expect people to make a big fuss at the bottom. And also I'm hopefully inspiring health and safety leaders through my Bill Buzz Bake approach. So I'm running a face to face boot camp in April where I sit down with people for uh, 12 people for two days. We go through the whole methodology, the skills behind it. So you leave not only with a plan, but with better influencing skills. And I'm thinking about putting that online as well. So that's the two main things I'm doing at the moment. And I've got a thumbs up. Isn't that lovely? Thanks, Rosemary. Sounds sounds uh, <laughs> sounds sounds good. Um, so um, thank you, thank you, Karen, for for sharing some of your um, opinions and insights there. I'd love to, there's been a lot going on in the chat, but I'd love to um, open this up to any uh, anybody that wants to kind of get involved. So as, as always, if you go to reactions, raise your hand, um, then uh, raise your hand and I'll invite you to, uh, to say hello. Uh, Lionel, how are you doing? I'm not too bad, Christian. Um, first time work today, so brilliant. Good stuff, um, yeah. Br brilliant conversation and... Uh, Nice to meet everybody on the call, um, including uh, Karen. It's um, some insight as well um, in terms of 
your book, which I'll be looking to also get and add to my collection of many other books um, that I'm uh, interested in, because obviously we need to keep on learning. Um, so we spoke about the zero harm platitude. If there's one thing that I, I, I despise um, and I've despised in my sort of um, career is, is that zero harm uh, platitude, because I believe what get usually when you measure something and you put a figure to it, it can get managed and manipulated so that people achieve those targets. So for me, I, I, I don't um, subscribe to the zero harm. I've never, I've never done because I think um, when you have a situation whereby um, people uh, are incentivized to achieve some of these goals or these zero harm, either they won't report or they will um, manipulate the figures so that it uh, it suits whatever sort of uh, goal that you've set for them. Um, in terms of visions, um, I think when I was thinking about the vision there quickly, I thought I wrote down, uh, let's have safe, safe production as a as a vision. And I think for me, it's, it's an easier uh, sort of approach. I don't know if Karen will agree or not. Maybe I'll get a, a feedback then. Uh, but uh, that's the one I, I, I aim for and I always um, uh, aspire to because um, people need to understand that, um, you know, safety should be what we do um, all the time and it should never be uh, a priority because priorities change all the time. Um, so safety should never be a priority, but it should be what we do and how we do things all the time. Uh, so it embeds in our culture. Um, and then uh, I'm intentional about how I approach safety. So I believe um, empowerment is a, is a big aspect. Um, so empowering those who are usually at the sharp end of the risk. So the, our risk assessors, our operational teams. Um, so yes, I agree top down approach and then bottom up approach as well but giving people the the right training and ensuring that they're also competent coaching them uh, at every step um, listening to them and seem to be listening to them uh, challenging them uh, like karen has mentioned there um, via engagement and how can we do better and asking them these critical questions and trusting them to make the right decisions even if we're not available so i think you know, um, these things are things we can do to empower people to ensure that they make the decisions whether we are there or not. Um, and I don't believe in looking over people's shoulders when they're completing tasks, because, you know, if we're doing that, then we're clearly employing the wrong people. So yes, people are our biggest asset because, um, you know, there is, you know, equipment, we can get equipment on the market, suppliers are going to have there, but if you don't have the right leaders, supervisors, uh, safety coaches in place, then, you know, you are not going to uh, be a safer place because, uh, yeah, I think uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there because I think I can go on and on, <laughs> but yeah, I'll, I'll stop there, I'll stop myself. Thanks, uh, thanks, Lionel. Um, Karen, if you want to jump in on anything, just 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 feel free to. Um, but uh, if not, then what I might do is is uh, invite Yusuf up to give uh, give his view. Oh no, we can't hear you, Yusuf. Neil, why don't you come in? Hi, Christian. Hey. Yeah. Um, no, Lionel had, had some really, really good points there. Um, people are our biggest asset. If we can motivate them and, and incentivize them and encourage them to be the face of safety around the company, that's that's much better than one person as the as the point of contact. Um, in terms of um, zero zero harm, zero accidents, I've been on a bit of a journey here myself because I initially thought it was a brilliant idea because how many accidents do you aim to have? That was my initial thoughts. Um, are you saying that 10 accidents a year is fine and those 10 people are absolutely fine to be injured? Um, even if you're talking one one person being injured, is is that okay? Is that is that good in, in even compared to maybe 100 this year? Um, and when I was working at the time, there was a bonus incentive for um, zero accidents. And what I found was it promotes missed reporting. So all the minor accidents disappear. Nobody gets issued with a plaster. Nobody gets issued with first aid. 
and yet the first aid stops miraculously disappear every month. Um, and so there's a whole lot of slightly larger accidents not being talked about until it's too late to investigate them. Um, actually found a larger accident being treated and then the injured person being sent off to a &E, which wouldn't have been reported if I hadn't walked into the first aid room. Um, all because people would have missed out on their bonuses and that person would have become the prior of the company at the time. Um, and I've realised that it's, and this is where, where I am at the moment, the, the zero harm is impractical for that reason. Nobody wants to be the one that, that puts the one on the board. Um, and so it's about re raising hazards and removing hazards. So making, the making any workplace as safe as possible. So the accidents, accidents being accidental by the very nature, you can't plan for them not happening. Um, it's about making people understand how to manage their own safety as well, well as possible, how to look after each other, how to raise anything that's, um, that they need to, um, and that put the right systems in place. That's, that's it for me, and that's just my opinion. So, No, I, yeah, I like that, Neil. Um, I, I was having a conversation with somebody recently um, about my area of, of slips and falls, and I was sort of making the point that, you know, if you do X, Y, and Z, you can have, you know, confidence that what, you, what you're doing the right things. Uh, and then I said that, you know, typically when we work with clients, they see a 57% or more reduction in accidents. And and someone came back to me and said, but if you're only reducing your accidents by 57%, how can you have full confidence? And I said, that's a very good question, a very good point. Um, but I made that point that you've just made, which is that accidents can still happen, things can still happen. Um, but unless you, if you don't do all these other steps to have that confidence, then you, you, you know, you're going to be in a much, much worse position. So it's kind of, you can control what you can control and some things you can't control. Um, Adam, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, no, just uh, touching on the transfer, um, transformational leadership. Um, so we did a big piece at our site years ago. Um, and the SLT is very on board of health and safety. Um, it's the first thing they talk about in any meeting. Um, but the problem that we have isn't so much top-down approach or bottom-up. It's actually the middle. So you talk to any of the shop floor operatives and they will tell you it's product, product, product. Yet you talk to the senior management and it's health and safety, health and safety, health and safety. So you're absolutely right, but you, you've got to engage that middle piece. Your, your, your managers on the shop floor a key to it all just wanted to put that out there karen have you got any Can thoughts just, on yeah, yeah just come in there because um yeah i'm very aware of that and because the middle section of the organization are very much the pressure points because if things aren't being communicated well and effectively it's really the middle managers that get the brunt of that because they're having to influence upwards influence downwards um so i would say that's probably more of a symptom of the company not being aligned, but because I'm very aware it's a symptom. I mean, sometimes I've e I've even been brought in specifically to get the middle management on board, but I'd say it's a symptom of a lack of cross-company alignment and effective communication. And just to respond to Lionel, um, your vision is brilliant. I would just add the word the at the beginning, the safest production in, add your country, or your industry, and then it becomes really aspirational. Back to you, Christian. Thanks, Karen. Um, I've got an example, um, just just going back off what Adam said, that, that sort of brings this to life. So I was working with a large uh, pub and nightclub uh, and restaurant company, and went to a site in Birmingham, where the general manager had been there. This was a nightclub. The general manager had been there for years and years. And she knew that site like the back of her hand. Um, and she, in terms of like slip and fall and trip risks, you know, there were some areas of concern, but she'd kind of worked on different things that had proven to be successful for her over the years, including this particular type of spill mat that she found worked really well. Um, because, you know, if you're in a nightclub and, and everyone's a bit drunk and you are going to get spillages on the floor, but you're not necessarily going to be able to get in there and dry the floor and so on and so forth so these these uh, spill mats for her worked really well um but yet she'd been blocked from buying them from the 
uh, regional manager or the area manager above her because of its sort of p and l uh, issues whereas if you spoke to the board um you know they would be saying all of the stuff that all boards say which is safety is our number one priority and and all of this stuff so that's just you know a, a real life example of where the uh, the sort of vertical um silo uh, effect has, has come into play um yusuf do you want to try again yeah i'll try again can you hear me now yeah great okay hello hello karen hello christian thank you for hosting this great idea for 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 table round table discussion i in fact you 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 launched a frenzy when you talked about zero <laughs> zero uh accidents. i know i shouldn't <laughs> i shouldn't have said that should i really i, I took us off off off, uh, off of uh, off of course a little bit so yeah when i saw that I said oh okay so uh i had a couple um a couple of notes, a couple of remarks, observations, especially what Lionel and um, Neil said before. I totally agree with them. Um, uh, in fact, for me, uh, I said we can maybe try and manage to make zero risks, known risks, and achieve zero, maybe, hopefully, incidents. But accidents, we can never achieve them unless, like Lionel and Neil said, you can omit them to have like a great image of your company, especially with sustainability reporting now and so on and so on and so on. So for me, it's like impossible to have really zero accidents. That's a dream, but let's keep it that way. So we live in a real world. Um, and I liked a lot, moving on to the next subject, Adam, what said, Adam said, it's about the middle management problem. Uh, like we turn back to the main uh, issue that this uh, round table is talking about, empowering people. You cannot empower people and engage in safety topics, issues, and improve and transform your business without communication. If communication is key and this is what I like even in my all webinars uh, and discussions uh, for me I always finish my opinion communication is key to success um, this is where transformational leaders come in um, thanks to them in fact you can uh, uh, involve the management committee boards of director by saying not only products and productivity is most important let's turn the eye and keep an eye on safety issues and and our mental well-being the mental well-being of our all our stakeholders not only our employees because we are talking about suppliers we are talking contractors we are talking about clients or customers and so on and so on that this goes on so it's great to see your book and I'm going to buy it, Karen, I think to, to read some bits about it because I think it's going to be interesting. But the I, thing hope is... I'm on a, I hope I'm on a commission here, Karen. <laughs> but the thing is, um, I think uh, communication and the way that you communicate, you can involve everyone, empower everyone and make everyone involved in terms of safety. Uh, it's a, I talk a lot, so I would try to make this short. As <laughs> um, So for me, Long story short, communication is the basics and the key to save everyone and establish and empower people and not by investigating. For me, I don't like the questions, why, 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 like you said before, Christian. I prefer just good morning, how's your day? Everything's going well, first day. Second day, good morning, how was your day? And just by being there, the people will start talking a little bit more and then by getting maybe some management uh, someone from top management with you check what's happening here take them by the hand walk the walk and then everything will go fine that's it good stuff thanks very much yusuf um rosemary or rosemary's cat meow <laughs> i think the cat's Resist. eaten is the cat eating you, Rosemary? It's, it's taken over the screen. Um, and you are, I don't know, perhaps perhaps Rosemary's disappeared for a minute. Lionel, do you want to come back in? Yes, Christian. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say, like, um, I think a lot of people have raised uh, an important an important issue, and I think it's it's been an issue for, for me as well, uh, to tie in you know what the the directors need um for from a safety perspective and then what the middle management uh also want because they're probably most focusing on production and getting uh the products out there so i think all of us in this call can be that sort of safety asset that links the two up uh, nicely by ensuring that the communicate the line of communication is um 
is clear uh, between you know the what the directors need and the directors are asking for and also with the line management because um i think we we tend to get a lot of pushback um when we are coming with this message to say well this is what we need to do and there's always a bit of pushback from middle management but i think we are that key uh, connection that needs to ensure that you're linking from operators all the way middle management to um, the, the board of directors. So we need to facilitate that and be, um, you know, as, as robust as we can to ensure that the message connects throughout the business. And I think that's one of the things that we need to, uh, to do um, as safety professionals. Um, and then the other thing was in terms of the behavior, uh, I, I don't like targeting behaviors because I don't think behaviors operate outside of the environment. Um, and I think we need to consider our systems uh, and because we already know that, you know, to be human is to err and stuff like that. Uh, and we expect people to make mistakes. Why is it that we don't focus on making our systems much more robust so that they are less um, um, mistake, uh, they're less mistake prone to human error? Um, and we try and eliminate that that as much as possible. So I, I don't think uh, behaviors uh, can be taken in isolation. It needs to also go with um, our systems and um, uh, and our procedures as well of how we we, we intend to 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 go forward as, as safety professionals. I think. Thank you. Can I just add something there quickly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, just I couldn't agree more with Lionel. I think the more you work up the hierarchy of controls, the more you're going to reduce your reliance on human behavior anyway. And also, but you've got almost like your behaviors, they're more leadership behaviors that I would call habits, reflexes that get people asking questions, challenging. So it's all around communication, really getting people doing and saying the right things for health and safety, which create a culture. So just wanted to sort of temper what I'm talking about in behaviors and say, yes, I couldn't agree more. Let's try and design the need for those behaviors out of the system. It's not so much the safe behaviors, sort of the rule type behaviors I'm referring to. It's more, you know, the asking questions, the challenging, the intervening, the talking about safety first, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, no, I love that. Um, Rosemary, did you want to say hello? Oh, we can't hear you. Perhaps your mic's not working very well. No. Oh dear, that's a shame. I, 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 I was expecting a perfect intervention from you there. But um, shh. um. <laughs> all right. Well, look, guys. Um, we're we're coming up for an hour, so that's kind of the 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 length of time that we allocate for this meeting. So I know a couple of people have had to shoot off. Um, Karen, I wondered if you might just want to do a quick sort of summary. Uh, any final thoughts uh, and then we could we can sign off yeah just a final thought is that if you can get your vision right it allows you to make that start of your cross company elevator pitch so um you know we were talking about how can we as health and safety professionals really facilitate that lack of misunderstanding that's or that lack of understanding that's going on so if we've got that vision, then we can start looking at, OK, what's the vision? What do we need people to identify as to be a part of that? What do we need to what values do we need? What do we need to believe? What behaviours are behind that? And what would the environment look like? So we can have just a, a really simple, even graphical elevator pitch. And it all starts with that vision. And the vision is really important because you're not just looking to inspire safety people. You're looking to reach those people that think that safety is absolutely nothing to do with them. So we're reaching the layman, really, your everyday person with that vision. What would make them want to get involved? Yeah, I love that. That's great. That's great. Well, look, thank you very much, Karen. I uh, really enjoyed um, having you on today and, and feel free to join any uh, further uh, versions of this as a as a panelist as, as, you, as you wish um, and thanks every, everyone else for, for joining us as well um, see you again in a couple of weeks and uh, in two weeks time actually I'm going to go back back a bit niche again I'm going to do 
something about slip strips and falls prevention so if that's a risk that you're facing in your business then uh, come and join us in a couple of weeks for that thanks a lot everybody thanks for joining us on the safety and risk success podcast if you've enjoyed this episode please hit follow and do share on social media does anyone you know spring to mind as a great guest even yourself If so, please contact us on podcast at slipsafety.co.uk. See you next week for another episode.